Um, so our next presentation today is uh, from Katie and Alex from uh, the Intercollegiate Psychedelic Network, uh, talking about defining accountability experiments in diversity practices. Um, so Katie is a student organizer, PhD candidate, and a lifelong drug policy reform advocate, interning with EPA in 2015 and serving on SSDP's board of directors from 2015 to 2017. Uh, she works to bring an ecological consciousness to the nascent psychedelic industry uh, to elevate BIPOC voices to the forefront of psychedelic scholarship and to ensure community stakeholders are fully integrated into emerging psychedelic healthcare paradigm. Katie's dissertation inquiry explores emerging eco-spiritual rituals among millennial women for working through compounded traumas in the community rather than clinical settings. She's committed to facilitating conversations that empower communities to envision and create a post-prohibition society. Um, and Alex, he graduated from the University of Pennsylvania in December 2017, studying computer science at the School of Engineering and Applied Science, uh, the statistics at Wharton School. Uh, Alex is a co-founder of the Penn Society for Psychedelic Science and the Intercollegiate Psychedelics Network, and is currently a mycelium member uh, of IPM. In addition to his roles at, at those organizations, Alex recently joined the Tech Committee of Maps Canada and has previously worked with the Qualia Research Institute on mathematically formalizing the study of consciousness. Alex is fascinated by neuroscience, physics, philosophy, information theory, and above all, the profound interconnectedness of everything. Uh, in particular, he is fascinated by non-ordinary states of consciousness, Carl Fritzton's free energy principle, and Danny Bassett's recent work in uh, energy landscapes. He hopes that through his work, he can contribute to alleviating the unnecessary suffering and co-create a more connected and blissful future. So really long bio, guys, but um, if you could take over with the screen share um, and take it away, please. Thank you so much, Leo. And thank you for the very, very kind introductions and for the invitation. So I'll begin by giving a brief introduction of IPN and Katie will take over and expound upon the diversity and inclusion projects that we're working on. So to begin, IPN is a student organization dedicated to the development of students into the next generation of psychedelic leaders. And our organization structure is really inspired by the life cycle of mushrooms. So we have a fairy ring of mushrooms or functional groups, uh, each led by a cap populated by spores. And collectively, we are advised by birds who fly by the organization offering strategic wisdom, intel, and advice. And at the center of the fairy wing, ring is the mycelium or the board of directors, which, which foster the development and nurturing of the network as a whole. This mushroom really should be much smaller, I think. The idea of a mycelium is to be underground to support the entire network as a gardener and as a nurturer. So not shown in this diagram, so we have seven mushrooms. Not shown in this diagram is the conference mushroom. And collectively, we have about 35 core members of IPN spread across the entire world from, um, from Harvard to Princeton, to Oxford, to Cambridge, to Switzerland, um, and to the West Coast and East Coast. And together we have, we have more than 10 projects happening across all of these uh, mushrooms. So for example, our research and development mushroom is hosting a journal club, a book club, a uh, job board, a IPN mentorship pipeline, as well as SURF, S-U-R-F, which is the Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship. That is our flagship project for the research and development uh, mushroom. And our goal is to be able to fully fund students at different psychedelic research centers, such as Imperial, John Hopkins, and Berkeley. And that will launch with full, that will launch uh, fully funded in the summer of 2022. The research and development mushroom is also hosting something called Psychedel X, which is a TEDx style talk, uh, student co talk competition for psychedelics. The applications have recently closed and we've received over 90 applications from all around the world for about 24 to 30 spots. And the idea is that the entire program will feature comprehensive workshops. It'll feature peer review, uh, mentorship connections, as well as a week long interactive event in, on the week of February 22nd in 2021. And the top submissions and the top presentations at that talk will be able to present to a panel of judges, uh, distinguished judges, uh, including psychedelic researchers at Imperial and John Hopkins, as well as distinguished members of the psychedelics community. 
With that, I would also love to share briefly our principles and our values. So we have nine principles and we have 10 values. And every single one of our values also have specific manifestations of these values, which are concrete actions that we take um, to a, that, we align, that we use to align with our principles and values. So our principles are based on the North Star Ethics Pledge, and they are starting within, building trust, paying it forward, studying the traditions, considering the gravity of our actions, working together to focus on the process and not just the end result, creating equity wherever we can, and to lead with transparency. And from there, our values include diversity and inclusion, focusing on the underserved, respecting indigenous knowledge, harm reduction, solidarity and collaboration, public awareness and education, socio-politically and culturally engaged science, sharing the earth, cultivating a tremendous sense of playfulness, and of course, transformative and restorative mediation. So we developed these sets of principles and values over a course of around six months, uh, meeting weekly, the seven co-founders of IPN meeting weekly, if not twice every week to sit together and think about really our, our niche, our place in this larger psychedelics network. And so we are very, very blessed and grateful to be advised currently by Rick Strassman, um, Monica Williams, as well as Alan Davis of the Source Research Foundation and John Hopkins Psychedelics Research Unit. We are slowly extending additional invitations to researchers and distinguished members of the field. And we look forward to growing our network as a whole. So now I'll turn it back to Katie who will lead us through a brief discussion on diversity and inclusion. Thank you so much, Alex. And I'll invite you all to uh, pull up the Notion doc link that we sent and I'll go ahead and copy and post it again, just in case. Beautiful. Um, wow, I just kind of got lost, honestly, listening, Alex, because <laughs> I love listening to what we're about and what we're doing at IPN. And um, as we introduced in my bio, I've been doing student organizing uh, within the psychedelic space for a while. My first SSDP meeting was all the way back in 2009, when I was an undergrad at the University of Arizona. And I kind of just stuck with it. I had some wonderful mentors and advisors over the years, was encouraged to get involved with MAPS as a volunteer very early on when I was still an undergrad. And because of that experience, found my way into SSDP, where I had my first very serious awakening to the reality of diversity, or rather lack of diversity and inclusion processes within the drug policy movement, and then also within psychedelia as well. And through SSDP, through all of the programming that we have, and all of the the peer support and peer leadership that we work through and all of the different um, summits and conferences and events that we host that are co-created by the members and participants. I had a very good environment to work through a lot of my own um, blind spots and a lot of the things that I didn't know I was bringing into my research, a lot of the bias I was bringing into the work and organizing I was doing. And because I was in a very uh, loving and supportive community container, I was able to really unpack a lot of the baggage and trauma and um, impacts of systemic oppression that are built within my own life and my own work. So from that space, I decided to continue with my master's degree at CIIS, got involved in the transformative leadership program and learned a lot more about getting into depth with building these new processes around diversity and inclusion and in figuring out how to build platforms where we can actually meet one another in a very loving and holistic way while still being completely authentic and not feeling like we're attacking or taking away from anyone else's experience. Um, we use a process at CIIS called Synergic Inquiry, and that is a very long form process of mediation and community building. And through that and several years of experience within California's cannabis industry, I was able to unpack a lot of those processes and learned a lot about what works, what doesn't, what turns people off from engaging in dialogue and just how nuanced a lot of these conversations are. Um, I started also getting into more consciousness studies and research around uh, organizational management and understanding how we work within groups, how that's different than working individually. And then looking across my full spectrum of my peers, I'm a self-admitted millennial, um, and seeing how we integrate and work differently, um, being in online environments, for example, and really using our virtual resources in a much different way than our predecessors. It allows us to 
be much more agile and much more responsive, I think, to issues that arise within our communities. And so I'm sharing all of this because this is what inspired me to get involved with an IPN and bring a lot of this insight and wisdom into the work that they are creating. So on that note, uh, my role within IPN is as a conference cap. Um, and my job right now is organizing and planning our annual flagship event, which is the Intercollegiate Psychedelic Summit. Uh, the intention for the summit is to serve as a community-wide platform with we psychedelic students being the experts of this community. And our goal is to bring in as many different diverse viewpoints and perspectives on psychedelic science, research, and culture as possible. And through roundtable discussions and facilitated dialogues, create a, a space where hopefully um, we can start meeting one another in community again, uh, not necessarily in um, aggressive dialogue that doesn't allow us to move forward and create new solutions. And so that's the intention behind what we were planning with IPS 2021. And as part of that, we figured we needed a special project to create these, this platform. Um, one of those projects is our diversity self-assessment scorecard, we're calling it right now. And as I'm sure we can all recognize and notice across the entire psychedelic conference ecosystem well, and beyond it within academia as well, we have a lot of issues around diversity and inclusion. Um, when diverse voices are presented, oftentimes they're tokenized and there's oftentimes an interesting thing that happens within psychedelic conference systems where we'll have the indigenous presenter come and present their viewpoint, and then it's immediately followed by um, an investor who's in, you know, investing in an Ibogaine uh, facility or something just minutes after the community member was pleading, please don't abuse this medicine and this molecule, please respect our traditions. And then it's immediately followed with a guy who's telling you how to do that. And it's just, there's so much disconnect around it. Um, and we started seeing examples of people being pulled from stages because they didn't have um, approved viewpoints or perspectives. And we didn't like how we were seeing that process happening around cancel culture as well. And with all of this in mind and recognizing that we're at this very important intersection within psychedelic science and the future of research and the future of healthcare, we wanted to create the space where we can start coming back to center again and return to the round table, return to the forum and see what we can come up with. So. That's kind of the goal behind the summit and our diversity self-assessment project is our transparent process of showing to the world how we chose our presenters, um, what uh, blocks of perspective we think they're facilitating, and what our average score is for gender diversity, geographic diversity, educational diversity, and all of these other different areas that we want to ensure we're getting a diverse perspective. And we've been running that through and we're building a literature review around it that we expect to be able to release. Um, I'm hoping that my SPOR member who's leaving this project will be able to get this published as well. That'd be great for her. Um, and that's our biggest facilitation process that we're going through right now is this content planning where we're bringing in all of the different perspectives and creating a transdisciplinary platform for community dialogue and following this diversity self-assessment report card, we're going to be able to hold ourselves accountable, hold the community accountable with us. And then through that, invite other conference and summit organizers to reflect on their own self, um, see how they're performing. And instead of calling out and letting a conference organizer know that they didn't do a good job, we are much more about calling in and sharing the scorecard as a resource so that together, collectively, we have a baseline of what diversity looks like across psychedelic studies. And hopefully with that, we can start having better conversations around diversity recruitment within psychedelic research. And that's the other part of this conversation. Um, and this resource list that I shared with y'all, there's a long, well, not really long, there's a brief resource list, maybe 15 or 20 articles on there, um, that if you're not familiar with this specific conversation um, within psychedelic studies, you should definitely start here. And as we're having all these conversations about what's wrong, we're not having as many conversations about what shifting the research paradigm looks like. I've only spoken with a few um, researchers in the last couple months, honestly, who, saw the need to completely address diversity recruitment strategies. Um, there's been a lot of work saying that there's these uh, instances of lack of diversity. We're pointing that out, we're calculating it, but we're not actually addressing the problem. And so we've been working on the back end through um, IPN and some of our other community relationships about figuring out how to get that kind of stuff funded, um, trying to encourage investors and um, 
people who have the ability to fund other types of research to be more cautious and careful with what they're funding. Um, and also there's the process of when we're going through our speaker presentation selection um, for the summit, we'll also be looking at who is, what research is being presented. Um, for example, uh, there's a recent study that Ben Sessa released um, and there were no women evident anywhere within his study. There's over hundred participants and I mean, it's 2020, it just didn't make sense to us to have that be the case. And so while that information might be nice to know we can you know have a little footnote about it we might not exactly invite that presentation into our summit because it's not meeting that diversity um, measure that we would like to see so it's just all about us trying to transparent and figure out how to do this well um, i don't want to say that we're going to do it right because we know it's it's impossible um, and that's kind of what we're realizing at this point is that we can only do the best we can go forward as transparently and authentically as possible, bring in as much insight and advice and support from outside psychedelia as we can, and through a community process, continually reform what we're working on and make it better. Um, yeah, so that's that little bit right there. And the other thing I would definitely uh, mention before we go into some Q&A, because I don't want us to get too lost in this, um, is that on the top of this resource list, there's a new study that just came out um, one of our birds, uh, Dr. Davis and Dr. Williams, I think was also yeah, on this as well. And the title of this is People of Color in North America Report Improvements in Racial Trauma and Mental Health Symptoms Following Psychedelic Experiences. Obviously, those of us who work anecdotally with community members know this is true, and we have experienced this and seen this within our communities. And so to have research and data around that, I'm very excited to dive into this study. And what we would hope to do within our summit format would be to look at that study, talk about it a little bit, and then immediately go into talking about what implications that has for the rest of the research, the rest of our community organizing um, the policy around healthcare delivery, and all of the rollovers that come from it. And if we do this, we're hoping we bring in as many ideas as possible. And with the diversity of ideas from all the different places, we hope that IPS can be an annual review of what's going on across psychedelia. We'll have our diversity assessment report that we release and invite others to do annually as well. And we'll see where we end up a year from now once we're in our reviews process. Yeah. So I see we've got a couple of questions going in. Um, and Alex, if you have anything else you'd like to add about what we've been working on as far as our experiments and accountability go, I would love to include that too. Sure. So one of our mushrooms is the social policy and impact mushroom. And it is currently working on a few projects involved in harm reduction, as well as addressing potential uh, uh, policy solutions that we can, we can we can bring to the table. Uh, one of our HIFE members, uh, the Penn Society for Psychedelic Science, recently actually submitted a policy memo to the uh, Pennsylvania state gov uh, governments, and it calls for the decriminalization of dr drug checking paraphernalia, especially in response to the opioid epidemic. And it won second place um, in the policy, one of the policy memo competitions at Penn and it's being published in the journal of Science, Policy and Governance. So we foresee ourselves, IPN is a, is a pending 501c3 and 501c4 organization. And so we see ourselves taking a larger uh, community organizing as well as a policy shaping role as we move forward into the future. And as we do that, it is super, super important that we uplift these minority and BIPOC voices that have historically been marginalized and not just lead from a dominated culture perspective. And so encouraging diversity and inclusion and allowing the aperture of experience to open up, not just within what has always been, but what can be is really, really core to our values. I love that. Well, I feel compelled to dive into questions. Um, that's a good idea. Sure. So first of all, yeah, thank you guys. Thank you, Alex. And thank you, Katie, um, for coming on in such short notice. First of all, we really appreciate that. Uh, and letting everyone know all the great stuff that uh, IPN is doing. Um, really appreciate that as well. So we can just jump right into the questions. Um, the first one's from Michael. And uh, Michael was asking, uh, what do you make of the most recent MAPS Canada situation uh, with the open letter, uh, I guess the response to that open letter, uh, and most recently, um, Monica Williams and others canceling in an upcoming webinar in protest. Um, and he's just kind of asking what corrective actions need to take place. I don't know if you're familiar with the open letter at all, but I'll let you go ahead. 
Totally. And I think I can take this one because I have definitely been tracking, um, trying to figure trying to figure it out. And I, I'm looking at the next question as well, which mentions as students or interested community members. And I'm going to keep that in mind as I answer this MAPS Canada situation, because I'm not from Canada. MAPS Canada is not my organization that I have volunteered with before. Um, so I definitely don't know all the inner workings and the dynamics of what um, is going on um, necessarily. So I can only speak of what I've been observing as an outsider. Um, and oh, it's definitely an interesting circumstance. And to me, a lot of my response comes, well, comes through within our own presenter speaker selection process that we've been working through and trying to preemptively recognize that there are going to be um, concerns over speaker selections and that type of thing. So we're creating something before launching an event to help us address that. So what corrective actions can happen? At this point, it, it's, it's hard to answer because so much has already occurred. And so my brain is definitely looking for to, to the preventative measures that we can take because that's, that's how I like to try and think of it. Um, once you're in a cycle of mediation, um, that's a different story, but I don't know that that's fully the case at the moment. And so that gets to be an interesting thing as well. Um, and the, the interesting thing also about um, canceling events and pulling events, I have definitely um, facilitated some of that in my time. Um, I definitely went out of my way to pull um, people who have been harmed, harmed others sexually, sexual assault victims have spoken up and I've done what I can to reach out to ensure that those people are not invited to stages. And I definitely understand the sentiment to help curate uh, content and ensure that people are able to you know, communicate that they don't want certain organizations involved. But without having a preemptive process, it's really hard for an organizer or an event producer to, to know what to do or where to go when these things come up. So I can't even recommend a correction action um, other than consistent community accountability meetings. And that requires much more long-term investment than reactive processes can afford at this point. I wish I could offer more, um, only in that from, from my perspective, it's been a very um, strong case study for figuring out how to navigate diversity practices because it's, it's been very volatile for a lot of folks. And it's, it's brought up a lot of conversation in our communities. And I will also mention a little bit on this uh, sheet that I gave you all, the Notion page here, um, there's a link for the Psychedelic Social Justice Collective. Um, and that is organized by my friend Kaylee, who is also a member of IPN. Um, and she has started this Psychedelic Social Justice Collective and is beginning a series of monthly accountability meetings specifically designed to give community stakeholders spaces to, to come in and share what needs to be shared. And in time and through process and facilitation, that feedback does make its way back to the organizers of event spaces and the people who are in powerful positions um, that are needing to have some um, feedback. So getting involved in that kind of thing where you have the community uh, platforms and you're engaging in a respective way, not just on social media, right? Where you're just kind of regurgitating opinions, but when you're actively moving through a process with facilitation, that's just gonna be so much more effective. So if you haven't formed those communities, I would definitely work on building them locally um, as quickly as possible to help navigate the growing pains that we are all sure to be moving through for the next 20, 30 years. And I'll leave it there. <laughs> awesome, thanks. I think you touched on the second question a little bit, um, but more so from like a, an organizer's perspective, I guess from someone um, who's like just a community member, maybe not an organizer, not um, someone like MAPS, but just someone that's maybe a part of a MAPS committee or an IPM committee. Um, what are the, Lindsay was asking, what are some of the most impactful things in your opinion that we can do to, as com community members to um, promote diversity and inclusion? Definitely. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is specifically around accessibility, language accessibility, um, disability accessibility in terms of speech and of hearing. So just very simply asking event organizers, what, what are you doing to handle accessibility or what's the process for getting an accessibility request confirmed or fulfilled? And if their response is, what do you mean? Then that's the first opportunity to begin engaging them in that process of thinking about how to deliver content that's more accessible. Oftentimes they'll have a very small, simple answer and that's, um, that's good. I mean, the goal is to ask the questions to ensure that people know that these requests are here to be made. Um, that's a very, very simple thing. And you can do that with anything, honestly. Um, you can do that with your, you know, apartment buildings recycling plan to make sure that they're, you know, paying attention to ecological issues. It's just ask. Asking is the most important thing. And if nothing's there, have a couple of resources on hand that you can facilitate. You don't need to go 
overboard or, you know, write very long emails. Usually it's just a matter of sharing some resources and like communicating that it's a concern. What would you add to that, Alex, anything? <laughs> I think that was wonderful. Beautiful. And if you have any other thoughts, um, you said that was the first thing. Were, are there any things that we, that we are doing right now that is, uh, in, in addition to the diversity scorecard, thinking critically about in, uh, promoting diversity and inclusion, even within our own members? With the journal club, we do. We've got every fifth journal club is devoted specifically to diversity issues, whatever that ends up being. Um, and that's, you know, hard fix. And that's been around it since the beginning. Um, and as part of our volunteer processes for planning IPS, we are definitely reaching out to all of our members to see who can help with translation. Um, we're prioritizing funding and sponsorships to go to live interpreting and live ASL translation. And I also learned recently that there's um, American Black Sign Language as well, which is a completely different dialect of sign language that began, um, well, because Black people weren't allowed into schools. And so people created their own language and it's similar to American Sign Language, but it's different. So just, you know, I'm, I'm learning more as I'm going through conference planning by following our values as I'm doing our process I'm continually learning all of the new little ways we can do this kind of stuff. So that's the other thing, if you get, any type of a value system in place and make it part of your work and outreach and your you know, weekly check-in with yourself, you'll be surprised what kind of stuff just starts coming up as being an easy way to make a difference. Awesome, thank you. Um, so another question here, uh, what advice would you give someone who's interested in pursuing a career studying uh, and working with the intersectionality between racial stigma slash trauma uh, and psychedelic, psychedelic healing uh, and post-traumatic growth uh, from the US? The first thing, and if I keep going too much, <laughs> let me know, Alex, and jump in here too. Yeah. Um, the, the first thing that comes up is the importance of having your own personal center and spiritual practice. Um, more than anything else, as you start to uncover the reality of the situation that we're in and the many decades and hundreds of years of violence that has happened, it's an emotional toll. And honestly, that's why most white people don't do it is because it, it's, it can be very painful to start, you know, digging into this kind of stuff. And that's why we go into cognitive dissonance. And I can only speak for myself, of course, and from my own experience, but that's, that's been my biggest surprise is how much of your energy goes into grief processing um, is what it feels like for me, because it's a, a lot of a death of a, of a dream of what you were sold, a bill of goods, you were promised all of these levels and layers and the truth hits. It's just like any psychedelic trip where the truth comes through and you can't avoid it. And you got to sit with it and then you have to figure out what to do with it. And for me, having a spiritual practice in place where I'm frequently reflecting and I've got uh, mentors and peers who I'm connected with who can help me unpack some of the processes. Um, and then in my CIIS program, the Transformative Leadership Program, we have the entire thing is embedded with these types of principles and values. And you're unpacking your own biased ways of knowing, ways of viewing, ways of researching the world and contextualizing this in a way that makes it possible to do the bridge building and the uh, code switching necessary to be effective working in support of anti-racism practices. And it's a practice. That's the other big thing is it's always a practice and you'll learn things and you'll be able to process them much more quickly in time. But during that first awakening period, and I'm experiencing this with you know friends and family who are just starting to get into some of this work. And we definitely see a lot of variety within our own IPN membership as well, as far as education around anti-racism work goes. Um, but holding that community space to know that we're always trying and we're holding each other accountable. And that to me is an essence, a spiritual practice, self-reflection, community building, circle processes, and authenticity. Yeah. <laughs> that is super well said. And I was going to say something super similar. And that is the first item of our principles, which is okay. starting within. It is tempting and it is easy to fall into this trap that there is one way to contribute, that there is a single career path, and yet to contribute meaningfully to this field, especially a field as intersectional and as diverse as psychedelia, whether or not you are a grassroots organizer or a researcher, a translational or clinical researcher, or even like a venture capitalist, there's, there are ways to contribute in any, every, every single way, as long as there's a connection and there's an integrity in, in your work. For example, Tabula Rasa Ventures is a venture capital with an accelerator focused on women and minority founders, uh, BIPOC founders, and perhaps that is some way that they can contribute to healing and growth. Uh, you have 
researchers like uh, like Taylor Leon and Monica Williams, you know, working from the clinical side and, and working from like the anthropology side to work on elucidating what the landscape in terms of post-traumatic growth and racial stigma. And then you have organizations who are doing grassroots organizing. So the point is these, the, the constellation of ways to help are truly diverse. And it comes down to what, what honors your integrity and what you feel most called to when you really develop a presence to listen to what arises when you are still. That's fantastic. And I would definitely add to that, that part of my own journey, I've now been in undergraduate and now graduate education for the last 14 years, almost like it's been a really long time and I'm very excited to be here. But from where I began my work um, as a pre-med student, and then I learned about the realities of the drug war and completely changed my major and my perspective. Um, and then I kind of went very far overboard the other way to where I let go of my own goals and passions that I had carried with me and put all of my work and effort into community organizing and drug policy reform to the point where I had lost a little bit of my, my own internal passion for ecology and for spirituality. And so it took my friends also in this community container also encouraging me to come back from the sense of um, having to overdo it or push too hard or kind of a sense of martyrdom that sometimes a lot of people can fall into when they're trying so hard to help change a situation. So coming back to finding the balance and figuring out how to integrate your personal self fully into the work that you want to do while also contributing fully to the community. It's, it's a balance, but it's, it's beautiful and it has to happen in a connective community. Never, never alone. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Uh, thank you guys for that as well. Um, just a couple, I think, administrative questions to finish things off. I think some of them have been answered in the chat. Um, just a few things. People are just wondering um, if there's any opportunities to get involved with IPN, um, how you can attend the journal club meetings. And then Thomas is also wondering if uh, you guys, if the audience can get a copy of the self-assessment mm -hmm. checklist. Most definitely the self-assessment checklist um, will be released. We're hoping for our first kind of PR blast to come out in January around that. So definitely sign up for the IPN newsletter and you'll, you'll see it first um, and that's coming. Um, the other thing I did want to mention is that the, uh, the link that Alex did share here for the Discord channel, that's specifically for the Psychedelic Social Justice Collective. Um, as you join the Discord channel, you can reach out for the invitation for that. Um, and then you can participate in that monthly accountability and psychedelic, psychedelia session that that my friend Kaylee's organizing. And then for the journal club, same thing, you sign up to the uh, newsletter and that'll come and that's bi-weekly, I believe. Um, and there's a, a record and archive of all the past presentations that are there as well. And I think we record most of them too, so they should be fully accessible. And I think that's everything for now. <laughs> and in terms of uh, getting involved with IPN, oh, absolutely. Yeah. There are so many ways to get involved. Um, so we have seven mushrooms. And many of them are still looking for scores. And so scores are the project leaders. And we are, are the number of projects that we have are actually is growing really, really quickly. And so if you would like to get on the ground zero of, of getting involved in the project or you can start your own, you can absolutely visit our website and apply to be a score. Uh, in addition, uh, IPS 2021 is going to happen um, around uh, May, June, of 2021 with a few hibernation events happening beforehand. So for example, we have a hibernation event that is going to be in research and clinical medicine, a hibernation event with psychedelics, which is a week long uh, interactive presentation for the TEDx First Psychedelics. And we have a social, and po uh, social policy and impact hibernation event for RPS 2021 and uh, perhaps a fourth one. And then finally the fruiting event, IPS 2021, the, the fruiting body which is a week long, uh, which is a week long event, which we hope will be quite epic. That mixes together a virtual platform as well as virtual uh, various satellite events all around the world: the West Coast, the East Coast, London, Oxford, uh, Switzerland, and and the idea. And and so there's so many volunteering opportunities that are available. So if you would like to get involved, please get in touch. Perfect. I would also, <laughs> and I'm going. I'm also going to share the. Uh, the link to the IPN Garden Discord community. So if you would like to participate in additional discussions and find a community with IPN, uh, we feel free to feel free to join. I love it. 
and I would think maybe some of the other things I'll just add in closing here is that within within this whole COVID time, um, the amount of virtual and online organizing that's emerged and community building that's come up within the Psychedelic Student Network is just, it's mind blowing. I have never in my over a decade of student organizing been so impressed and so excited with how many people are coming on board and are just ready to build a, a network of, well, brilliant, compassionate people who want to create an equitable, just, psychedelic healthcare system. Um, our event for our summit for 2021 is co-creating our post-prohibition future. So the whole idea being that we're all bringing in whatever that vision is and actually putting it to paper and seeing what that looks like and figuring out how to collectively build it so that we can stop arguing about policy and start building better solutions. And that's kind of the goal. So um, plenty to do to get involved with the summit. Like Alex said, plenty of volunteers, but also if you're wanting to create some content and maybe you have an interview you want to do or maybe there's some um, incredible researcher that only you nerd out about <laughs> and no one else will ever put them on a stage but you want to be able to have a chance to talk to them the goal of the network is to be able to help the students be able to facilitate those types of connections and so if that person wouldn't necessarily be interested in just talking to you one-on-one -on -one, but if they can do a you know hour-long fireside interview chat with you um, for the summit they may be more likely to talk to you. So think about it as being an outreach opportunity and using the power of a network to help build your own experiences as well. Yeah. All right, guys. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I think if anyone wants to get involved with IPN, the, I, Alex and Katie's uh, emails are going to be on the slide deck and you can also check out their website. Uh, once again, thank you guys so much for talking. Um, we appreciate you guys coming on in such short notice. I'm just going to pass things off to Leo uh, to end things off for tonight. Thank you so much for having Thank us. You. Thank you so much for inviting us. Bill, you're muted. Whoops. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone. I posted a link in the comments with uh, any feedback and uh, that, that you would like for us. This is the first time that we did a general code focusing less on the scientific aspect. So we would love to get some uh, get some advice from you guys on how we can make this an even better experience for you. Um, this, will, this is our last general club of this year. However, next year uh, in 2021, I'll we'll be kicking off with a really, really interesting talk on the parallels between virtual reality and psychedelics. And uh, we've been really antsy to, uh, to you guys for a really long time now so this will be a really cool talk so um and also uh Ingman Gorman who um who wasn't able to make it a few months ago he is coming back to uh discuss post-traumatic growth after MDMA assisted psychotherapy as well um so with that um hope everyone has a really good um holiday season and see you guys in the new year take care <laughs>